Fabulous Legacy Park. Hello, good afternoon. Hey, good to see you. Good to see good you. Good to see you. This is amazing here. It, we are in the beautiful Legacy Park. Absolutely. My name is Dr. Felicia Blow. And I'm Dr. Keith Lee Park. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so you call me Felicia. I'm going to call you Keith. You just call me whatever you want to call uh, me, all right? <laughs> Can I get a Hampton hug? Oh, uh, my goodness. This is so great. It is wonderful. I am delighted to talk to you today. I'm glad to be here. One, it's a beautiful day. Yes. We're on the beautiful campus of Hampton University. We both are Hamptonians, Absolutely. and we get to talk about one of our favorite subjects, philanthropy. No doubt. <laughs> so let's, 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 maybe can we talk and walk? Absolutely. So this it's is, absolutely gorgeous. isn't it amazing? Our president, yes. 44 years of strong. Of service, of excellence. Dr. William R. Harvey. He helped set the standard. You better right? believe this it. This is why this is the standard of excellence. I love right? it. We I call love it, it the brand standard is Hampton, for sure. <laughs> You are the standard of excellence, because no, that's why we, we're talking. We, we are part of the standard of excellence, right? I'm claiming that. The reality is, as I said, you can't be what you can't see. That's, so I love that. Everything that I am today came from my foundation here at Hampton. Well, tell me about your foundation. Tell me what you did. So, you know, I was walking on a campus, and I was reflecting that just 30 years ago when I came to this campus, how different I was, right? And we all change in 30 years. But, you know, when I walked on this campus at 17 years old, um, I was a young black kid from the city of Philadelphia who knew more people in prison than in corporate America, right? I'm first generation everything. I yeah. didn't have a ton of career exposure. Mm -hmm. Really only knew that I wanted to be a doctor because, you know, there was a black doctor in the neighborhood and I kind of admired him. I knew I wanted to help people. But, you know, I was really good at math, didn't know what an engineer was. I didn't come up from a family with a history of attending college. And so when I found Hampton, uh, and my mother was a big proponent of Hampton. And you said you're first generation, right? Yeah, first generation. So somebody instilled something in you to find Hampton. Absolutely. And when I looked at the brochure, I'm going to tell you, I only play, applied to one school. When I looked at the brochure and I saw all these beautiful black people, I said, uh, that's where I'm going. Yes. Yes. And it's still beautiful. Absolutely. And it's still beautiful. And Legacy Park is emblematic of that beauty. These individuals that Gorgeous. have shaped Hampton. Gorgeous. I mean, you got Frederick Douglass, uh -huh. Barack Obama. Uh, Mary Christian's on the other side. Um, it, it's this just, is by far the most beautiful campus in the world. I believe And you. it is the best place for black people to learn, especially oh. people who are coming from an urban environment yep. who oftentimes need to escape certain settings. Yep. So Hampton was like an escape for me, right? Escape? I did, you know, so tell uh, me about how you grew so up. So in 1992, when I finished high school, that was the most violent year on record in the city of Philadelphia. The record was just broken this year, and so there are many parallels of what's happening right now in Philadelphia, and just nationally, it's a conversation around gun violence. Mm -hmm. You know, last year, Philadelphia had like 562 murders. It broke the record. The record year, once again, was my senior year in high school. So at that time, violence was everywhere. And the summer before attending Hampton, I remember making a conscious decision like, I just need to stay in the house, or I'm not going to make it to Hampton. I had friends who were in pre-college and were calling like, yeah, we're having a great time down here. I didn't attend pre-college. Um, I actually didn't even know about pre-college. Yeah. Um, but, but I made a but decision. this is your safe place. This was it. This, this was is it. your safe place. Um, you are truly black excellence. You are emblematic of what we all... We are black excellence. We are black excellence. We are black we excellence. Are, but we are, but I'm talking to you right we, now. We, I'm talking to you right now. This is black <laughs> excellence. This is all black excellence. I'm, into, I'm first generation. You're first generation. Yes. I grew up in a rural environment. Uh -huh. You you grew up in an urban environment. But here's the thing that I find fascinating. You weren't exposed to philanthropy as a youngster in your household, other than church, perhaps. Yeah, that's it. So how did you come to want to grow this company, want to build this foundation, and want to instill the values of giving in others. So my life has always intersected with philanthropy, and I was on the receiving side. Uh-oh, tell and, me more about that. Was... You know, I attended a lot of school. After Hampton, I went to medical school and business school, and I often say every time I was accepted into a school, to make the deposit, my mother had to borrow money, right? Yep. And so, like, I, I, you know, I often remember so many people helped me along this path that it was my, like, it's just been part of my DNA to help as many people as possible, right? And to provide the exposure. You can't be what you can't see. I came here and I saw black excellence. Yep. So when I returned back to Philadelphia, I wanted to show young black men from this environment who grew up just like I grew up that you can be something different. But here's the thing, though. You connected your black excellence, our black excellence, to philanthropy, mm -hmm. to giving. Mm -hmm. You connected 
So that grandma mm -hmm. that didn't go to college mm -hmm. but worked really hard helped me to come to the school of my dream. Absolutely. You connected that. How did you, what inspired you to pull all that together? So it's so important for all of us to get back, right? Yeah. And oftentimes we forget the institutions that help make us. Uh, we should not just think of Hampton or any other HBCU during the homecoming season, right? <laughs> we have great pride. We have a great Although time. Although homecomings are great, Oh, they're right? great, right? It's the best party ever. <laughs> it's like therapy. We come back and say, oh, my gosh, we give out all these hugs. But at the end of the day, it's so important to make sure that this institution sustains and not, as, not yes. in a position of weakness, from a position of strength. Strength, right? Yes. And oftentimes, we feel intimidated by even the word philanthropy. <laughs> Spell it, right? <laughs> right, right. They're like, wait, what is that, right? We're intimidated by the word philanthropy, but as a people, talk about our ancestors, have always been the, some of the most generous people. Yes. By far giving a greater percentage of our dollars to charities. Absolutely. I'm but so, we forget, say that again. Say that again. So black the people black in general people. are the most generous group of people in the world. Yep. By far giving a greater percentage of our income to charities. That's right. Right? But oftentimes, we forget institutions like our universities. And what I will say is, I think sometimes us as college educated, we get out in the world, we get in the civic society, we start serving on boards, and we're supporting organizations in our local community, but we're not remembering the institution that helped to make us who we are. So what do we tell our fellow alumni? What do we tell them? Um, so I work here at Hampton. Mm -hmm. I work in uh, development. Mm -hmm. So I know when I see these young people, the challenges they have, making tuition, yep. buying books, yep. getting some place to stay, yep. making sure they have meals. Yep. How do we help our alumni understand that they need to help? So I think there's a big misconception that occurs sometimes when they see Hampton in the news and they get a big gift from you know, McKenzie foundation, Scott, Ms. Or, Kenzie Scott mm -hmm. right? They think Hampton's got all the money in these. That's so not far from the <laughs> truth, right? Like that helps, but it's so important. And one of the biggest indicators that you know of, you know, college rankings is alumni participation rate, alumni right, right, giving right. rates, right? And so what we need to do is figure out ways, how can we challenge people, whether it's through matching gifts, right? Yep. yep Give yep. what you can, whether it's five dollars as a as a college, you know, senior year, first year out. I talked before about, you know, um, Michael Bloomberg. Yeah, that's right? a great story. Michael Bloomberg, his first gift to where he went to school was five dollars. Unbelievable. Now he's become the largest contributor to Johns Hopkins, to any actually nonprofit in the world, giving billions and billions of dollars, right? So it can start with a five dollar gift. This is a journey, not a destination. So, so essentially, you don't have to be wealthy. No, you don't have to be no. Bloomberg or Jay-Z. No, you don't or... have to do that. No, you don't have to be that. We, I, I, I focus on the everyday philanthropists, right? All right. I focus on those who are going to I never you. heard of that. Yeah. Every everyday philanthropist. philanthropist. philanthropist now, right? what's the definition of an everyday philanthropist? So when you round up your change at the checkout, you're an everyday philanthropist. When you're giving like at your church or school, you're an everyday philanthropist, right? It's not about a big gift. We have to decouple the word philanthropy from wealth. Okay. We have to connect it to like concern, compassion, and the next generation. I do think though it scares people and maybe we need to figure out a way to connect. So mm -hmm. I, I love philanthropy, but I also love communications. Mm -hmm. And telling stories sometimes helps, right? And helping to understand that giving doesn't always have to break you. No. And it's not about always getting the shine. No. And it's not always sometimes seeing exactly where every single penny goes, because that's another um, concern. I want to know where my money goes. If you look at Hampton, you see where it's going. It's, it's sustaining this campus. That's exactly really. right. Keeping Hampton strong. Right. Testing, one, two, testing. OK. So. Um, it's our responsibility as Hamptonians yes. to keep Hampton strong. Yep. Yes, we can go to foundations yep. and get support and get funding, but we gotta step up. It's sort of like living in a house and you let your own roof fall in. Is that somebody else's fault or yours? It's totally our fault. <laughs> and it's actually sad as a you know, if you think about it, all this pride that we have in our university should be reflected in our giving. That's right. And it's not about the amount. Right? Oh. Being a philanthropist, once again, is your time, your talent, your treasure, and your ties. So either leveraging your community to help support Hampton, 
uh, you know, coming back, volunteering, mentoring students here, creating internships, that's all a part of what it means to be a philanthropist. And scholarships. Scholarships, for sure. So I focus a lot on scholarship. We, um, together today, while we were on campus, saw a student. Yeah. And she's struggling around money. Yeah. And to see a young person crying when they have a GPA that's 3.5. Wow. And worried about money. Wow. It should not happen. It breaks my heart. And that's why I love what I do. He's so, so I, and I'll tell you, I would not be here today if it wasn't for the presidential scholarship that I got when I attended Hampton. I was a presidential scholar my freshman year when I came here, and I would not have been able to afford it if it wasn't for the scholarship dollars. Right. So why is it so important for me to give back? Why is it so important to make sure that we have a robust both scholarships and endowment? It's all a part of... Oh, the endowment. That's the, you know... The, Endowment is another word. Spell it. Right, what is it? Right, like right, philanthropy. Right. It's this, this strange word. I don't know what that is, so I'm not going to give to yeah, it. Right. Help demystify endowments. Endowment is really like the anchor of an institution, right? It really shows the long-term viability and strength of an organization because it means is that you know people have invested in the long term. Endowments is a portion of, of any nonprofit's budget. You know, typically you're going to spend 5 to 6% of the endowment. Mm -hmm. You have to do that. Then you have to support scholarships, right? And so you can direct gifts. If you want your, all your dollars to go to scholarships and not necessarily endowment or operate, direct your gifts to the scholarship. But it's so important to do so. It's so important. And it's not a secret. No. It's not something anybody's trying to keep from you. So I think I mentioned to you, uh, I secured my PhD and it was about HBCU Black fundraising. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm gonna take that. There you go. But the challenges we have are both without and within. Mm -hmm. So we there's the, there are these negative stereotypes of the leadership at HBCUs. Mm -hmm. It's that old, you know, solar, color yep. of my skin determines yep. how good a leader I am. Which is sad. Internally, we don't trust each other either. Mm -hmm. What are you doing with my money? So, how, if you were talking to an alum that said that to you, I can give my money, but I don't know where it goes, what, how would you help them overcome that you know, objection? So, you may not be able to call it BS, but I'm going to call that <laughs> BS, right? I think that's an excuse not to give, saying okay. you don't know where it goes. They I know, like it. They know in an institution like Hampton, especially if they've come back to homecoming and see all the buildings that have gone up the campus that has maintained its premier status, right? Like, you can't say, you, this is not an institution that is dilapidated, that is falling down, and you're questioning where the administrators are, are spending the resources. It just shows up when you walk the campus. So I, I call that BS, right? You may not be able to do that, but I'm gonna call it out BS as alumni. Well, we need, well, they need to hear that. The, and I'm happy, I'm not gonna call it BS, you're uh -huh. right, uh -huh. but I'm happy to help seek to understand. You know, the, yeah, the yeah, seven yeah. habits of yep. seek, First to, to understand, understand, then be understood. Right. Try right. to understand where they're coming from. But at the end of the day, and at the beginning of the day, you've got to support your institution. Mm -hmm. So I want to know about what you do, your organization. What are you, what are you, you said some amazing things. I'm so proud so, of you. You know, Hampton was a part of my foundation as who I am as a black man, right? But when I left Hampton, I had probably a really a life-changing encounter. I, you know, finished Hampton, I was in medical school and business school, I've always been very entrepreneurial. So I started a commercial cleaning company. So I'm cleaning offices at night, because I'm not afraid to work, uh, while going to school during the day, and going to business school at night. And just so happened, my major account was a company called Suburban Cable, where the offices I was cleaning. And to make a long story short, the guy who ran Suburban Cable sold his company to Comcast in 2000 for $6.7 billion. Good Lord, right? How are you? He became one of the original signers of the Giving Pledge. He became my mentor See, up until recently. What happened. the Giving Pledge is. So the Giving Pledge is, you know, Warren, uh, Warren Buffett, Buffett, Bill Gates, and a bunch of families. Now Robert Smith is a part of the Giving Pledge. It's billionaires who have committed to giving at least half of their wealth away uh, to charity before they die. Mm -hmm. So my mentor, Jerry Linfest, was well on his way to doing that. He was going to do that with or without the Giving Pledge. And he was also extremely compassionate and helped to change my professional trajectory. So I would have been a physician in the community, but what he did was empower me to actually help people in real time. So we worked together. I chaired the board of the Linfest Foundation, and I felt like I could have died and went to heaven, which is a large foundation in the Philadelphia region. When he came to me and said, Keith, I have my name on enough buildings. I actually want to support people that look like you, and I need you to help me figure that out. I don't know. He was a 70, middle, 75-year-old white man at the time saying, listen, I know that I want to help 
people from underserved environments. We have other programs to help people from rural communities. How can we help the city of Philadelphia? And I want you to help me on this journey. And so we set out and we focus on three areas, right? Our early literacy for young people, out of school time and career pathways, okay. right? And so that was my initial foundation into big philanthropy. But working with him, I realized, wait, you don't have to be Jerry Lindfest to make an impact, right? You don't have to give away, you know, $100,000, $500,000 to make go. an impact, right? You could do it with $50, $1,000 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. is really significant, it right? Certainly and to is. an organization that's important to you, that's a small ask for the many blessings that we have as alumni from this institution. I, I, I just, I sit here in awe of you. You have your medical degree, you have your business degree, you, have, you ran a company before you began chairing this foundation. Yep. What it says to me is Hampton prepared you, young 100%. man. hundred percent. I tell people all the time, and I sit on a lot of different panels, and you know, if they say, would you do anything differently? And the thing I would never do differently, I would all, still go to Hampton. <laughs> you can get me in the pen, Harvard, <laughs> Columbia, any Ivy you name, I'm still going to Hampton because I would not be who I am today, right? I would have had to, you know, go to one of those Ivies. You have to fit into their environment. That's right. I was able to come here and literally be free. And be molded Be too. molded, be loved, be cared yes. for. You know, the compassion, um, you know, that the administrators show to the students here, right? The just sheer, you know, championing, you know, right. each and every one of these young people. You're not gonna get that in other environments. And so it's so important. But it wasn't, 100% an easy path for no, you, no, 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 And that's no, the no. part that I want you to talk about because I still, I believe that your failures, what per, was perceived as a failure, are some of the things that shape us and make us who we are. So, uh, if I can get back to Hampton, anybody should get back to Hampton. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say this deservingly so. Remember, I said I was a lot different mm -hmm. when I was we in Hampton than I am today. So unfortunately, I got kicked out of Hampton for a semester, right? I was, you know, I, I deserve, off, being right, young. yeah, exactly. Goofing off, being young, I got kicked off. And so I was angry and I was upset and you know, my, my mom made the most important decision ever. Cause I was saying, listen, I'm sick of Hampton. They kicked me out. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go home. And my mom was like, no, you're not you're coming not. back here. You're going to stay down <laughs> here. You're going to work. You're going to get back in. You're going to figure it out. And that was the best decision for me. That's right. right. But what Hampton did was teach accountability. It taught responsibility, right? It, it made you really, it taught you how to socialize and interact with people. I think like, you know, that, that Hampton degree comes with a, with a seal of approval and an unbelievable network. That's right, that's right. I, you know the song, if you can make it in New York here, you can make it anywhere. And you can make it anywhere. If you can make it at an HBCU. Absolutely. In a, in a nurturing, loving environment that takes no prisoners. We're not gonna change the standard because you don't no, wanna do it. not at all. Right? Not at all, it prepared you for excellence. Right? Excellent, excellent, excellent. So, so much so that when you know I returned home to Philadelphia, I realized that something was really wrong with the city. Oh. Deep, deep poverty, lots of black people in poverty, and I felt like I needed to take what I learned here at Hampton around black With a excellence. national football right, team, a right. national. Uh, you said it, something to me earlier that. Structural racism is a part of all oh, of these okay. institutions, okay. right? There so, you go. You there know, you go. You, you, it doesn't matter where you are, right? And so, despite the fact that we have this perception, I did, you know, that's a wealthy city, mm. that you have a lot of affluent African Americans, that people living there are doing well, mm. we right? Have a, we have a lot of poor African Americans in Philadelphia. I wouldn't even say affluent. We have a lot of. We, there's a lot of wealth in the area, but it doesn't it doesn't hit into black communities. And you know what? We have a That's lot of middle class. We have yeah. a lot of working class, but not affluent. It's emblematic all over the country, and yeah. I think that's why HBCUs are so desperately needed. My dissertation, we, I talk about the empirical facts that more black judges, doctors, lawyers, scientists come out of HBCUs yeah. and PWIs, that today, still in 2022, HBCUs educate one third of all black people who go to college. Wow. And if we don't keep our HBCUs strong, Right now, today, there's somewhere around 101, 102 accredited institutions. Mm -hmm. But over the last 20 years, there have been several closures, too. Mm -hmm. And it's predicted to um, be even worse by 2030. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're down to 75. Wow. And that is a disaster for our community, Absolutely. I think. Absolutely. Do you think, and I'm going to now ask you a question, do you oh. think what's happening with the uh, White House initiative is going to help, or? <sighs> I think... We cannot expect the government and others to help us. 
That's, that's just, a great I point. just, that's I a just great come point. back to, I do not believe that our HBCUs should rely on handouts to be strong. Well, we have these amazing graduates who are doing great things. So think about, I had, a, I did my dissertation and um, a president who was at a great institution said if every one of his alum gave $100 a month, mm -hmm. every one of his students could come to school scot-free. Mm -hmm. So is yeah. that a, a Bill Gates? Is that a Bloomberg? That, that's the point, though. It's not even, it's just participation. Just, do it. just doing it, right? $100 a month from all Hampton alumni would be transformational. It, transformational. Transformational. So how do we do that? What are we going to do, Keith? So we're what working we on do? that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, so part of my journey as a you business, as a physician, way. as an entrepreneur, and now running a technology company that's empowering what I call the everyday giver. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I got to uh, multiple careers late. So I spent medical school and business school, uh, came out, Ran and the you foundation. Keep, you keep, uh, my husband says, blousing over you, that. You, you, Going to medical school, young man. Come on now. Well, that, you got. I got to give you some. Uh, give, props. Give, give me some love on that. Give Woo! me some love. On that. that is huge. <laughs> it was. It was. It was preordained, right? Oh, I, you know, I love like, that. It, uh, yes. Since the age of five, I was going to be a physician. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I always said the doctor I wanted to be when I was five wasn't the doctor I could be when I was 25, right? So you had to understand business. So I went to business school because I thought I was going to be the CEO of a hospital or a health system. Okay. And then realized I was very entrepreneurial and I wanted to kind of run my own course. And then, of course, connecting with, you know, Jerry Lenfest, who was a huge entrepreneur. He empowered me, borrowed money from him to buy my first business. You know, but that wouldn't happen. He invested uh, he in invested you. in me, right? So that I couldn't have went to a, a bank and borrowed the money, <laughs> right? I and once again, I was not a part of his philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Anything that we did was business. So when I borrowed money from him, I paid it back, right? From that perspective. And so what my first business started off running that was a print design firm in the city of Philadelphia, but realized I wanted to do something that was more impactful and something that I was truly passionate about, and that was the philanthropic sector and democratizing that and giving everyone the ability to have their own personal foundation. So once again, you don't have to be Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or Jerry Lindfest or LeBron James to have your own personal foundation. Right? So how is what you're going to do going to work? Because I really like it. Can you talk about it a yeah, little bit? Absolutely. It, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, my company, Philanthropy with an Eye, really focuses on the individual giver, which is the largest sector in philanthropic giving. Mm -hmm. When you look at philanthropy as a whole, you know, it's a $471 billion ecosystem. $471 billion is given away each year. Only 4% of that comes from corporations. So corporations are great at marketing their philanthropy, right? 19% comes from foundations, right? right? So you add up every foundation, all the foundations that you talk to, only 19% comes from them. 9% comes from bequests. So when people die, mm -hmm. and that's the way, hey, if you don't want to give when you're living, Make Hampton, <laughs> you know, receive when you die. You want to do that, right? Um, but then, you know, 69% comes from individual givers. 69% of all giving comes from individual givers, right? So it's the largest part, but we often feel disempowered. That's right. We don't, think, we don't think it matters. We don't think it matters, but it is the most important dollars. If we as individuals stop giving to charities, the entire nonprofit ecosystem collapses. It collapses. Right. And so what we've done is made it, one, really easy for people to give and give in different ways. So rounding up your change into your own account, using rewards points and things like that, we're gonna be enabling that to be able to get, convert your rewards into charities and partnering with companies to set up what we call like a 401k, but for philanthropy. Wow. Right, so we have employers who now, instead of it being top-down philanthropy where companies are giving to the charities that the CEO is interested, why not put those dollars into the employees' hands and allow them to direct us to the charities of their choice? So there are Hampton alumni out there that are working in corporate America, you know, using matching dollars to be able to funnel those dollars here to Hampton. And the reason I really like that whole rounding up, yep. it being your own personal foundation yep. and supporting your institution or wherever, is it's invisible yeah. almost. Yeah, it's, you don't yeah, miss you, it. You don't miss it, and that's the point. We yeah. want frictionless <laughs> ways that don't really feel like it's hurting you. Yeah. You're doing it anyway, and now we're going to enable it to help, one, build your philanthropic legacy and then support the institutions that you care most about. So as we draw to a close, what are some of the, what's something you want to leave people, students, alumni about our conversation today? Is there anything that stands out to you that it's a really big deal? You say you don't want to miss that. So I think the first thing I'll say to our seniors who are graduating this year, <laughs> right, is that 
giving starts now. Mm. Thank right? you. The gift that you're going to get love on that. Mother's love Day. Love that, love that. The gift that you're going to get on this Mother's Day that you're going to enjoy with your family and friends is going to carry you for a lifetime, right? And so let's make a commitment to get $5, and they're spending way more than $5. If Bloomberg could do it, and think about maybe that was in 1960 something, so that $5 is maybe $20 now. <laughs> let's make that $20, right, that we're going to give to Hampton, even going out the door. And then for alumni like me who are out there working, who are, you know, taking nice trips and posting on Instagram, all the great things that they're doing, let's post what we're doing to help the university. Let's focus on what we can do to support the community. It's not about the fluff of, you know, of, of the life that we live. Let's think about the legacy that we want to live. Leave the, with these institutions. Let's think about our own individual legacy. That's the most important thing. But everything else is fluff. We Every must support our institutions like Hampton. My wife went to Spelman. She's a big supporter of Spelman, right? And I re admire and respect her. They have a great, you know, competition amongst their, um, uh, amongst their classes, right? And so we have, you know, we have competition all across the board, whether it's the fraternities and sororities, like let's continue to be competitive around what we're doing to support Hampton and support each other. And turn it into a post. There you go. Here's my $5. There you go, here go you go. Hampton. Let's go. Bang. Make it happen. That's really pretty. Yes, I it is. have this. I have enjoyed talking to you, young man. Absolutely. Well, oh. you know, I'm not mm. that young. <laughs> oh well, you, you look it. I am young. Well, I feel young. How about that? <laughs> <laughs>